there are some viruses we know that are they're more benign though okay um, the problem with, with using that as a, as a vaccine to, to try and protect the population is HIV mutates like crazy okay if you had two strains and one was virulent and one was benign um, and the benign one infected so the virulent one infected cells faster it's going to win the game so win the race. so I don't think it's a long-term evolutionary strategy. I, I don't think it'll work, okay? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting idea, though. That's why it's in science fiction book, yeah. All right. Uh, we'll go back and then work our way to the front. So in uh, regards to the fourth question, um, yeah. what happened to H1N1, how, what impact do you think that just the information campaign had on uh, reducing the impact of H1N1 and maybe how that relates just in general when we're talking about HIV yeah. and and not having that spread by just yeah. not having it, you know, using condoms or even going back to like Old Testament, like don't eat pork because, yeah. you know, eating animals is where we're getting some viruses from. Yeah, that's a very good question. So I, I, I will leave, you know, I, it'd be, be foolish of me to make a very strong statement about how well, for example, hand washing prevented this virus spreading. I, I, I'd, I'd be very... I'd be, temp I'd be tempting fate to say that. I don't know. The story of this virus was that early on, it looked extremely serious. The first few weeks in Mexico, the numbers were coming out. They were, they were terrifying because it was not that many cases and a lot of deaths. The problem was, I think we now know, the number of cases was far bigger than they realized. So they got the kind of ratio all wrong. It wasn't, it wasn't 50 out of 100, it's 50 out of 100,000, okay? So the death rate, so it looked initially like it's a real massive death rate. Now we know it's, it's really not much different than normal seasonal flu, okay? Um, whereas it now, all viruses, all flu viruses cycle, okay? They, we, have, we have some seasons where, so there are different strains of flu in our, in, our, in, our, in our population all the time. And they cycle what dominant one strain, other strain over the years. I don't think, this, this virus is now in a kind of down cycle, okay? Now, there are two outcomes that could happen. One is it goes away completely, or one is it comes back and then cycles like any other influenza virus. My, my bet is it will do that. It will be around next year, okay? It, it, will, it may even come back later, later this winter, or spring, who knows? But I don't think it's gone. I think it's still around. It will still come back. I'm, this, is, this is a guess, not, not, predict, not a kind of scientific proof, but I guess it's going to be there. And... It, it just burns out because of just standard population immunity, okay? As we get infected, I mean, in this room here, probably at least a third of us got the virus. We, we may, may not have known it, but we got the virus. That immunity dampers the, the effect, of, dampers the kind of ability to spread. So, it, it don't think it's gone away. When I say that question was kind of slightly sarcastic, I think it, I think it will come back. I, it may not bite us, but I think it'll come back and be in our population for a while. So one thing I've kind of heard in the news is that people are asking what happened to the regular seasonal flu yeah. now. And I hear them yeah. saying that maybe H1N1 yeah. outcompeted yeah. the seasonal flu. Yeah. And I have no concept in my head of how one virus like H1N1 would yeah. compete with the seasonal virus. That's a really good question. And, I, and, and they're all good questions. And I don't know if I can give you an answer. Okay, so at the moment, there are, there are three, before we had this virus, there are three strains of flu in our population. When you have a vaccine, a seasonal flu vaccine, that vaccine has three strains, okay? It has what's called flu B, which is a kind of mild thing, and it has two strains of flu A. One called H3N2, one called H1N1, a different form of H1N1 to this one. And of those, H3N2 is the more serious and the dominant one. It's been around since the late 1960s. So that vaccine has three types in it. When H1N1, the new one, came along, we saw in many countries that the seasonal flu dropped down dramatically and kind of and almost like died out. So in the U.S. at the moment, for example, we have this. This should now be the peak flu season. This is this is probably the highest week normally for flu. It's very low right now. Okay. Um, so if if there's any flu at all, it's all the new virus. There's almost none of the older three strains. So is it they've gone completely? Have they been outcompeted by? this new virus, or they hang around somewhere in reservoirs that will come back later on. Now, how the competition actually works, no one really exactly knows. It's most likely that what the virus does, it stimulates um, a T, maybe a T cell response. 
And that T cell is this, this part of your immune, your immune system. And that response is quite cross-protective. And by the new virus stimulating a T cell response, it protects you against the other ones, and they're, they're just removed by immune system. Okay, that's the most likely model. My own hunch is that it's that they haven't died out. Maybe the older H1M1 strain has gone. We have, to, we have to kind of watch what's going to happen. But I reckon, I suspect they're still in reservoirs somewhere. Okay. Flu, we think, comes from Southeast Asia every year almost. I, I, my guess is it's going to be there somewhere. And next season, they're going to come back. Net, for me, who works on influenza, the next season is going to be really interesting. Okay. What's, what's going to spread in our population. So it was an evolution. This is a really cool event. Okay. What's it? We actually can see this, this, this most strange new shapes coming, competing with each other and will one take over? So I don't know the answer. I, I suspect my guess is, um, they're all going to circ co circulate, but I could well be wrong. Question over here. Sorry, I had a little comment based on what you just said. So if there's an out competing of a virus, why not create a benign virus? to outcompete current viruses that are problems? Is yeah. that a possible? This, it's almost like your question, actually. So, so the problem with a benign virus is how long will it stay benign? Okay, That's, that would be my worry. So remember, the, the mutation rate, the evolutionary rate of these viruses is as astronomically high, Okay, far higher than you can predict. So what we've got to try and do is make this, make this benign virus that then never mutates into a bad virus. Okay? Now, vaccines are benign viruses. But they're kind of, they're normally, they're normally they're killed or they're kind of, they've, 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 dysfun they've made it dysfunctional somehow. But using a live virus that's benign, um, who's to say it would evolve into something else? So HIV, for example, we're never going to use an HIV, a live HIV virus as a vaccine. Just, it's just never going to happen because who's to know what, what could happen in the future? So um, it's, I, it's a good, it's a, I like the idea, but it's, it's, it's dangerous, I would say. I have a question about the viral DNA that's incorporated into our genome. Yes. Is there any in incidence of um, viral genes actually being expressed in our bodies? Because potentially it could be an evolutionary advantage if we express the genes at really low levels and develop antibodies for them, then we wouldn't need vaccines any longer. Yeah, that's a very good, you're absolutely right. Um, I've, I need to rack my brains on that one. There's one, so, so about... So in our genome, I think about one and a half percent of our genome makes our own proteins, okay? 98.5% doesn't make our own proteins. Of that remainder, between five and 10% is dead retrovirus. So retrovirus is like HIV. They're RNA viruses, they're like a DNA copy that gets into your genome. So more DNA is retrovirus, is dead virus, than is your, makes your own proteins. Of those dead viruses in our cells, in our body, there's one type, it's called HERV, H-E-R-V-K, that some people claim jumps around that does express its proteins. Okay, that's controversial. It's been associated with some diseases. So, that's, so um, the answer to your question is it could be, but it's kind of, they're still watching that. You, you're, in a way, I, your, your idea is, is a clever one, would it pay us to kind of express these things continuously as kind of um, a protection for future infection? The problem is evolution can never predict what's going to happen in the future, okay? So it's always, it always, selection always works on what's immediately in our population. So you can never say, I'll have that for the future because it's going to happen. So it doesn't quite work, but it's a, it's a clever idea. Other questions?